I mean, I've seen so many of you and got so many hugs today. We told Kara when she came here, get ready because you're going to get hugged a lot. And uh, it's true, and it's one of the things I love about this fellowship. This is home to us, and we're really, really, really blessed to be a part of you and to be here and to share with you a bit of the story of what God's doing in our life. At the first service I was sharing, and I wanted to know how many Bible college students were in that service, and I guess a lot of the Bible college students attend that service. Are there any Bible college students in this service? Okay, stand up, guys. Okay, I'm talking to you, okay? Tonight, I'm going to share a lot about what we've been doing up there, but as a product of Joshua Springs Bible College and as a product of this fellowship, a lot of my thoughts that I want to share today have a lot to do with what you guys put into Cheryl and I in our season here. So just want to kind of get into sharing this whole thing. I did want to um, share a little bit about how Gerald introduced us. When we were in the Philippines, we knew it was our time to come off the mission field. We were Skyping and uh, kind of asking Gerald, do you know anything you know that might be developing in the States when we come back? And, the, and they said, how do you feel about someplace cold? Which for us, living in the Philippines was awesome because there it's 90 degrees, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We live in a screened house. There are no windows because you need the breeze if you can get it. We're sweating. We're like, great, someplace cold. Where? And they said, Minidoka, Idaho. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, and it didn't mean anything to us, so we Googled Earth. We did that Google Earth thing, you know, come down outer space and planet Earth and North America and Idaho. Have any of you guys heard of Craters of the Moon National Monument? It's 500 thousand, half a million acres of lava. And right there is Minidoka. And it's a town of about like 17 buildings. And I'm looking at that thinking, what did we do wrong to get sent to Minidoka? <laughs> we had to call them back and they said, Minidoka County, Idaho. So we zoomed back out and saw there were a couple cities in the area. We thought, okay, we'll check it out. When we got back to the States in uh, November of 2011, in February, we went up there to check the area out. And um, Gerald and Marilee met us up there and took us all around. Jeff and Julie McRae, we stayed at their house, and we just fell in love with the area. Um, But as we were doing all this, I was kind of doing my research on where are we going to go, and um, our little pet names for each other, Cheryl is my cookie, because she's she's been a baker her whole life, and unbeknownst to me for a good decade and a half of that, she eats cookies like every day. But um, she's my little cookie. I'm her kooky, which is K-O-O-K for a collector of odd knowledge. I'm just into weird trivia. So I'm looking up all this facts and, you know, demographics of the area we're moving to, and I found out the name of the place, Minidoka, is a Lakota Sioux name that they would use when they named railroad stops where they would water up their trains on the Union Pacific coming across America. And Minidoka in the Lakota Sioux means the springs. And so we thought, how cool. We come from Joshua Springs, and we're moving to the county of the Springs, and we were so excited. So we went up there in February, and as we're touring all around, we hadn't really decided on what town we wanted to move into, but we ended up in Rupert, this cute town square. Looks like something painted out of a Norman Rockwell painting. And right there, near the restored uh, theater and everything, there's this kiosk. And as we got to the kiosk, the first panel that I stopped off talking about the the founding of this area in the middle of a desert. It's the Idaho Snake River Plain. It's a high desert. But I read this. It's a quote on the kiosk in the town square out of Isaiah 41. And beginning in verse 17, it reads this. Cheryl and I are standing there in the cold and looking at it and reading it and thinking, The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open the rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the land dry, and the dry land springs of water. That they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. And as we stood there, we knew we had found our home. We knew that God had brought us all the way around the planet and back again to the place where he wanted us to plant a church, the Springs Calvary Chapel. It goes on to say, uh, well, in a different chapter, Isaiah 35, we read this, and this was on the kiosk. It continued to read this way. It said, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. 
For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. And so we knew we had found our home. We began making uh, all the necessary things to get moved up there. And in May of 2012, we held our first Bible study at Jeff and Julie McRae's, uh, Marilee's good friend from back in the day, and their house on their deck overlooking the Snake River. And by the summer of that year, we were holding Bible studies in our front yard around our lawn furniture. The Abels were some of the first ones to come up to one of those Bible studies, and that was church underneath the elm tree in the front yard. But as things got going along, people started inquiring as to who we were. There was this guy on the radio who kept announcing the Springs Calvary Chapel, (laughs) Gerald. And I'm getting starting to get phone calls. And I remember the first phone call we ever got, I'm walking through Walmart shopping with Cheryl one day, and my phone rings, hello? Yeah, are you the pastor of that church? Yeah, that's me. Well, what kind of church is it anyways? And he starts interrogating me. I mean, it went on for... 20 minutes going up and down the aisles and I'm like, you've just got to come and meet us. I can't answer every question for you on the phone. So he showed up, he and his wife and who, his two kids. One of those kids was Kara. And er, Cheryl met Kara and instantly she knew that was the girl we've been praying for since the day that Aaron was born. Cool, huh? Sorry, Marilee. She outmatched Mitch on this one. (laughs) She's trying to learn to be the pastor's wife. She's doing a good job on the matchmaking thing. And we're so blessed. And so as the church began to grow, we realized we needed a place to meet. And winter was coming and we couldn't stay under the old elm tree in the front yard. So um, we looked around and we found an empty building or an empty, yeah, I guess an empty storefront on the Rupert Town Square. And from there, we began just to get together. There was just a couple of us, uh, Josh and Katrina Pound, and uh, Max Velarde, Cheryl and I, and the McCrays. And we would just have these services. The Lundgren started joining us, and we moved in this building and started into construction. And one of the first things I learned about building a church is framing and drywall and all of that kind of stuff. That's part of what you do when you build a church. So just to give you a little sense of what we're talking about, we've got a, um, a little movie presentation that Josh and Katrina Pound put together for us. We kind of try to capture the first year and a half of our church. And so if you're ready, we'll go ahead and uh, run that slideshow.
That was one of those 50 caliber sniper rifles that they use, and man, that thing was a hoot. The whole, the dust comes up off the ground when you shoot it and all like that. The fringe benefits of being a pastor. Um, <laughs> But we're just, we're just so blessed to be able to come and share the things that the Lord is doing uh, with us up there. As I was sharing with the Bible college students earlier, um, you step into ministry, you don't know where God's going to take you. You don't know what each day is going to lead. And that doesn't mean Bible college only. It's each of us, right? How do, how do Christians walk? By? Amen. Not by? Sorry. They walk by? Right. And so, you don't know exactly what the day is going to bring, but you step out knowing that God's in it, that He has a plan for your life, that you will indeed meet Him on the road today. So let's get out there and do it. And that's kind of how it's worked for Cheryl and I. When we were first Christians, newly uh, married, we were in a community where there was no Bible teaching church. We went to the grocery store, and up on the bulletin board was a 3 by 5 card that says, Anybody want to join a Calvary Chapel Bible study? I didn't know what Calvary Chapel was. I wasn't saved in the Calvary Chapel. Cheryl was. We went to the Bible study. There was three couples and two single ladies. We started studying God's Word. That's what we both knew, was that we were hungry for God's Word. We had been saved in a church where we went through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and I grew. After being in a denominational church my whole life for 30 years, all of a sudden I was growing in the Lord and I was getting to know Him and who He was and how much He loved me and what a sinner I was, but what a salvation He offered me. And we were, we were excited. Well, we'd share it with people in our community and one by one by one, we outgrew the houses that we were meeting in the living rooms. We rented a condo. Rec Hall. We're at a condominium project up in Mammoth Lakes, California. After a while, we outgrew that. We had to rent a place on the strip mall. We started meeting in there. We looked at each other and we're like, we need a pastor. There wasn't a one of us that had been a Christian more than a year and a half. We were all green behind the ears. I was just a knucklehead on Christ. But I did know this. That you read God's word. You worship him in spirit. You worship in truth. You put your faith in him. And you act as if he's alive. And you go out and you see what the day brings. And the church began growing. Well, same song, different verse. Cheryl and I, when we went up to Minidoka, that was the whole blueprint. That was the plan. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, God's word. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And it works, right? It works. It's one of the most amazing things, and I was talking to some people during the break here, but having come from different churches, before we came to JS, we really didn't know what a church like Joshua Springs can be like. And when we, we came here, spent a season on, in ministry and, and training and in fellowship and knowing how God works here. It's an amazing thing. This is a unique church. I mean, we've been around the world, and there's, we're not the only church that does church this way. But you know what I'm saying. You can go in and out of churches and, and there's just something that's just not there. And we learn how to do church right here. How to let God be God. How to let His Holy Spirit lead. Indwell us. Give us gifts. And let the gifts go. And to Pastor Gerald and the staff's credit here, you got something that God puts on your heart? Amen. Let's see what we can do with it, right? And we don't have a cookie cutter mentality that we're going to build a church that's going to be this or it's going to be this. God knows what the church is going to be. We just need to step up into our gifts and do it, right? Same thing we're doing up there in... in uh Rupert. So we got into the ministry up there and we're moving along and we're doing the building and, and we're seeing how things are going to develop. And a couple of things that we were able to do over the last year and a half. This December 13th of last year, we finally got our incorporation documents. We cut the apron strings from JS and we became a standalone church incorporated in the state of Idaho. But that came standing on your shoulders. We recognize that every step of the way, not just your prayers, but we've been getting visitors from you guys for like every month. People keep coming up. And a lot of people come up and they stay. And they've been moving up. Pastor Gerald told me he's going to put a moratorium and he's not going to let anybody else leave the church. Which is cool. You talk to God about that and see what you feel. 
But I found out even after you play some moratorium that Lindsay's moving up. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we welcome you to come up and visit. And between the help of everybody, the prayers of everybody, the financial support of everybody, the radio announcements, and all the different things that you've done, we've been able to get going. Well, back last summer when there was about 35 of us on a good day, maybe 20 regular core people, we decided there was a lady in our church that said we need to do something for Nagme Abedini and her kids while Pastor Saeed is in prison. So we decided to do an event in the park. And we, we put it out to the community, you know, fire department, whoever helped, come help us do this event in the park, in the town square. And just with, just in faith, just knowing it was the right thing to do, we put this thing together and it just, it kind of caught fire. It just took off. And people from all over the counties in southern Idaho got into it. And before we, were, we knew what was over, there were thousands of people who had shown up at this thing and we raised pretty close to $10,000 for them. And it was just, it was just 20 of us. Yeah, I mean, God is good. All we did was just step out and do that kind of thing. We've watched that happen over and over as we went through the year. Uh, Halloween came along. And we're like, what are we going to do? You know, different churches have all these things. Some of them have trick or trunk. Anybody know what trick or trunk is? A couple of you might, right? Where a bunch of people will show up at a parking lot, a designated parking lot, they'll advertise it, and then the kids go from costume to co in costume from car to car to car and get their snacks or treats out of the trunks. And, um, or else churches would do some kind of an in-house event because in Idaho... And, you know, the 31st of October tends to be pretty chilly. And you don't get a whole lot of people going up and down the streets. And we told the pastors, because I belong to a ministerial association up there, great pastors, great church, we love them, we fellowship, we do a lot of things, but they told us it's going to bomb. We've tried it. Nobody goes out into the cold for Halloween night. Well, we, we're, we're committed. What we did was we took one person's house in our fellowship and put Christmas lights all over it, brought out job lights, construction lights, just lit the thing up. Got this bonfire made out of an old tractor tire rim. It's about 40 feet across and sits up on wheels. Had a bonfire. You saw the leaf piles that we raked together. We put together coffee and hot chocolate and cider and snacks and tracks for outreach to the kids. And people started coming up and down the street, and you could tell, you could see parents come up, and they'd stop, the kids would go get the track and come back to the car, they would tell their mom and dad, there's coffee, the co mom and dad would get out of the car and come have coffee, <laughs> then next thing, you're, they're drinking coffee, and you can see them texting, you need to come over to this house, there's coffee, and there's a bonfire. And next thing we know, before the night was over, 500 people showed up at our bonfire. <laughs> right? And, it, and then the next day, this is the best part, I guess, was just for the next week, all the kids in school, they're walking around junior high and high school doing these little tracks that we had and, and showing their friends because it was kind of a magic kind of trick and they just loved it. And it just, it just spread throughout the school district. And uh, so it's little things like that that God has done to help us just walk forward by faith into what he's doing. The beginning of the year, we, we came around and we're having our Christmas candlelight celebration and things like this. And we're a humble little group, but we're enjoying our fellowship. Fellowship, the family that's growing up there is so sweet, right? I mean, it's like here, right? This is your family. And God has given us, Cheryl and I, Aaron and Kara, a family, people that we love. Uh, we got to be surrogate parents to Emery <laughs> for a season. Now that Jim and Sue Metzger moved up last week, we kind of got bumped, but uh, we'll still weasel in a little bit on that action. But we've got a family that we can be a part of, and so... We're going through all these things, and we're getting around the first year, and I don't, I'm, I, I'm not really, you know, an expert on how you run a church or anything like that, and I got this phone call. My cell phone rang. I was driving down the road. Hello, and he goes, yeah, I'm going to be in your area. I'd like to do a concert for you. Well, who are you? He goes, Dennis Sagajanian. And I'm, Anybody know Dennis Sagajanian? Okay, right. I'm going to be there on Friday. What do you think? Uh, can I call you back? Okay. I hung up the phone because I'm, I'm, you know, I've learned since then. The answer is, 
You bet. <laughs> and then if you have to, rebook. But you never put anybody off. It's like, so we ended up having him up there on January 2nd to start off the new year. But we thought, we want to open this up to the community. Our little building won't hold that many people. So we rented the, the Wilson Theater, a restored theater, on the square. And it opened up to all the churches. And that night, we were so blessed just to have hundreds of people come in. And so many people give their lives to the Lord. It was just a sweet thing. And this was something that God let a little group of us do to bless the whole community. And so through all of this, through billboards, through radio, word of mouth, the different events that we were been doing, we're starting to get out, get out who we are. And so we start growing and we're starting to see the numbers increase. We have a problem now and I, could, I would appreciate your prayer and I know a lot of you guys have advised me on this as to what I should do and I know the Lord's going to lead us but our problem is we're about ready to outgrow our building. And we don't know what to do. <laughs> so we could use prayer on that. Because honestly, I mean, it sounds like, well, just get a bigger one or go to two services or whatever. What do you do? You pray and you wait on the Lord. God knows what he wants us to do, and, and we're waiting to hear from the Lord. But we could use, we could really, uh, you know, need uh, prayer on that so that we'll see what he does. Well, this summer, we're excited, I guess not even this summer, but just coming up in April, we're going to be doing a Seder dinner, a Christ in the Passover. How many of you guys have ever been to one of those? You got an opportunity to do that this year? Oh, okay, well, come on up to Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have asked you before I said that. We were at the Christ in the Passover here last year when you did that. And it was really sweet, so I thought, we got to do that. And so we're getting ready to do that. And different people from different churches are calling up, hey, can I bring my youth group to that? And I'm like, sure, why not? How many you got? 20? I'm like, oh, okay. And now we've got to go out and buy more tables and, get, and do more preparation. But people in the community are coming in. We wanted to do an outreach in the uh, town square there with the gazebo and the beautiful fountain and everything. And, uh, but I had to go to the town council and get permission because we wanted to put the bonfire in the, in the town square. And I went to the town council and there's a rental on the gazebo as well, $50 a day. And we needed that for power for the sound system and everything. And so I proposed we do this. In addition, what we're trying to do is something we're calling gospel on the green. Last year, Joshua Springs sent up their missions team to Idaho, Buell and Tooele and us, and we did what we called a flash mob, where we just hit the park at the middle of the day when it's full of kids. There's a summer feeding program that goes on in the town there. Cheryl works with the school district with the feeding program, and every day at about 11 o'clock, 300 kids show up at the park for free lunch. We thought, we need to capitalize on this. So the team came up and we put on a, like a mini VBS for several days, and it went over huge. In fact, this last winter, when we were talking with some friends that go to church in a different community, she was teaching Sunday school and was asking any of the kids if they'd like to ask Jesus into their heart. One little boy raised his hand and she says, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And he goes, no, I did it last summer on the square, you know, when Joshua Springs was up there. That's you guys, right? You're saving little souls up there in Rupert. So we thought, that's good. Let's do it again this year. And so we asked the town if we could have the park on Tuesday and Thursday and rent the gazebo. But we started doing the math and $50, $50, $50. It would have been several, several hundred dollars, $750 or something. So I went to the town council and asked them, um, can we, you know, get some kind of consideration on that? And they said, we'll get back to you. Well, they came back and they said, you can have it. It's yours. We love having you in town. And, you, and Gerald just said... Can you read my lips? That's Mormon. It is. It is. But they love having us in town. And we're good neighbors. And it's amazing how they're going out of their way to help us build our ministry. This is something really interesting that we're finding out about the LDS community. And you can go Google it. There are more people leaving the LDS church now than ever. Even the leadership has said that. Basically, it's on the internet. They can go and research it themselves. But there's a lot of second and third generation that are starting to realize that it's not all that they had been taught. 
And so we're finding that it's not that we have to have all the answers for them. You don't have to be an expert on LDS history and all that. What keeps them in the church more than anything else is that if they leave, they leave family, they leave jobs, they leave security, they leave their whole life behind. And so what we're doing, we had a, a special group come in from HIS, he is uh, Salvation Ministries, and they gave us a seminar on the LDS. We're trying to become that place in the community where people feel safe to come to us when they leave that church, and we're getting people in the church that are coming out of the LDS ministries and knowing there's a place that will receive them. Um, I know there's a ministry that we have here on choices, right? And it's not about telling people what's right or what's wrong. It's telling them about the love of Jesus Christ and welcoming, welcoming them in so they can come to the Lord and receive his grace, right, for what they need. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do up there. So we've got the gospel on the green. We're praying for, you know, wonderful things to come out of that. Of course, we'll do light up the night. We'll do all the things that we've been doing, but just wanting to go out there step by step and not try to create some kind of cookie cutter, some kind of read it in a book type of church. It's going to be what God wants it to be. It's his church. And he puts gifts and talents into each person within the body. And as each person steps up and offers to God what God has given them, you see what kind of a church you will become. Same as this church. That's where we learned it. You go to Gerald and say, I think we should have, you know, this kind of ministry. Guess what? Gerald will say, that's a great idea. How can we help you? <laughs> right? And that's the way the body grows. And we'll see what God wants the springs to be up there. So, anyways, we're going through this, and it's, it's wonderful to see this growth happen. Um, one of the things that we did, and something that impressed me so much as a Bible college student here, it's a verse that I absolutely love. Do you know the verse on the door as you come in? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And well, let's see. I, I better now. I got to look it up. How embarrassing is that? I'm testing you on the verse, and I can't even say it. I got it on my T-shirt. It's on Cheryl's T-shirt. We got it on our coffee mugs. Okay. <laughs> if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He who believes in me. As the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that's our, that's our formula. To preach Jesus, to share his word, verse by verse, and let that do the work. And out of our hearts flow the living waters. That's our model. So I wanted to come with, to you with just an encouragement of what you guys are doing, not just in our church, but Tooele, you know, and, and so many different places around the world. I've been hearing all this talk about Kenya and what's going on over there. And, and you know, you could go on and on in different facets. I was talking, I can't remember who was telling me, but they were watching the um, overhead as it's flipping through slides. And it takes like six minutes to get back to the first one. There are so many things that are going on on here. But as you believe in Jesus, as the scriptures has taught us, the true Jesus, out of our hearts will flow that living water and it'll just be a blessing to those people around us. Well, I wanted to share with you really quickly, because that's another thing my pastor taught me. Whenever somebody gives you the pulpit, anybody gives you the stage, preach God's word. Be ready instant, in season and out to share the truth. And so I'd like to share with you about sharing the gospel out of John chapter 4. And so this will be a really quick, really quick, you know, run through chapter 4. I'm not going to go into all the little details, but uh, I want to get some basics, and I'm going to use the acronym SHARE. S-H-A-R-E. A model for sharing our faith with others and how we can go about doing it, how we do it there, and uh, maybe it's something that will help us. In John chapter 4, verse 3, Jesus, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. 
but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And so we have the story set up. Jesus is journeying. He's on the road. He's going to Samaria. He's in the town of Sychar. But I want to bring your attention to this. In verse 4 it says, But he needed to go through Samaria. God had to do something. There was something that Jesus needed to do. And the first thing about sharing the good news is that we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to be submitted. These are my S words. Sensitive to the Spirit. Submitted to God's will. And as you and I get up and go out the door first thing in the morning, that's where it starts. We have to just, you know, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Direct my paths. Where do you want me to go today? Who do you want me to see? Tell me what I should say. Put the words in my mouth and just be obedient to do that. So you need to be sensitive and submitted to his Holy Spirit. You need to be sent out and you need to seek what God's will will be for you that day. So there's your S. Verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And so we come to the second part of the, 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 the sharing. In verse 7, we see that Jesus asks her for a drink. He's humble. He is um, honoring her. When you ask something from somebody, you place yourself in the position of needing something and them in the position of being able to provide it. So you put yourself in a posture where you're beholden to them. And it's a great way to enter into a relationship. Ask somebody for something to help you. And so he humbled himself. He honored her. And as he went out, he, he dealt with her on a human level of human needs. You know, how many times have you gone out to share with somebody and you just jump right into the spiritual, theological, something or other? It doesn't work, does it? No. You need to deal with people like they're people, right? Jesus dealt with her like she's a real person, and humble and honoring and human and helpful and seeking help. And so he did that. And then he goes on and he starts telling her about if you had known who it is that's asking you about this water, he begins to... Um, anticipate that there's going to be an opportunity to share. Do you understand that when you start your day praying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit, use me, that God is answering that prayer for you? Do you know that? If you know that, then you can anticipate that there's going to be somebody in your path today that's ready to receive what it is that God has put in you. Expect it. Anticipate it. And then you can arouse curiosity as you go about sharing the living water that you have. You have living water, right? Let me try again. <laughs> Do you have the living water? Yes. Okay, if you've got the living water, then you can anticipate they're going to want it and you're able to arouse their curiosity. Why? Because you're bubbling over. Out of your heart is overflowing living water, right? And so if you're going out in the spirit and just drenching people, you can anticipate they're going to want to know what it is and arouse their curiosity. And so that's how you share. You begin by... Um, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, humble and honoring and helpful, anticipating opportunity, arousing desire, and then 
We get to verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and she said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one who you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say, In Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And so now we, we come to that place where Jesus began begins to relate to her and re reason with her and reveal to her the truth. As we go about sharing the good news with people, we have to be sensitive to the Spirit, humble and honoring, anticipating that something's going to happen. And then, as people become curious about what it is that you have to offer, now you can build a relationship with them. And now you can begin to reason with them about why they're thirsty and why you seem to be doing so good. Thank you. <laughs> nice, huh? Bet you wish you had one. <laughs> That's how it works with the living water. It's like, oh. Right? And so they're ready. So now it's time to reason with them. And you start talking about them about the realities of life. What did Jesus say? You haven't had one husband. You've had five. How's that working out for you? Right? And now that you've gotten close enough to them that they're able to open up with you, you can start talking to them about their world. How's that working? That atheist thing. How is that working out for you? You know, I heard a story of a, an atheist today from a dear friend of ours um, who was ministering to a man. He's an atheist, hardcore, um, but his dog died. He wanted to know where his dog went. He didn't care about where he was going, but he was really wondering where his dog would go. Right? Okay. But how's that working for you? Right? You got, finally got close enough that you could speak into their life. And you begin to reason with them. And you begin to reveal to them the truth of what their situation is. And that's the same for all of us. You can take it for granted. If you're a human being, walking this earth, you got issues. Right? Things aren't always going rosy all the time. But most people put on a face. And they won't open up to you. You first got to get in close enough that they will. And then you can start dealing with the real heart issues. And so you reason with them and reveal to them the truth of their condition. That's called the bad news. You're a sinner, right? And, and you are, apart from God, um, living a life that's, that's aimless and empty and hopeless. And that's terrible, but that's the place you need to get to in order to get to the last step. Step E, where you can evangelize them or explain to them. In verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And now he's got to the good news. You met me. I'm Jesus Christ. I'm the answer to your issues. I am the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the doorway to heaven. And when you can finally get to that point where a person's open and understanding their need of Jesus, and then you can give them Jesus, that's when their lives are changed. Isn't that when your life was changed? That's how it works for all of us. That's when my life was changed. And so that's how we go out sharing the good news in the same pattern that Jesus did with the woman at the well. That's what we're doing up in Rupert. That's what I was taught here. That's what we're going to do, Bible college students, till the day you die. It's the same story, okay? The gospel never changes. Christ crucified, raised on the third day. He's our captain. He, he's gone to heaven. He's proven it, and we follow him. Amen? Amen.
It's a sweet thing. It's a beautiful thing. So we're very grateful for the opportunity that we have to share a little bit about what God is doing in Rupert as well as around the world and just to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Okay? It's working. It's bearing great fruit. And as we continue just stepping out and walking by faith and each one of us just taking a little piece of the wagon and pulling it along, it's an amazing thing what God is doing all around the world, even in some far off place called Minidoka. Amen? Amen. Mike's a, a great history guy, but tell him the story about Oakley and Twill. Oh, yeah. Um, where we are in southern Idaho along the State River Plain, um, in the southern part of our valley, it was founded by Brigham Young. Brigham Young set a brigade of LDS uh, missionaries, if you will, up to establish Oakley. He sent them from Tooele, Utah. And so... Um, so we're, we're turning the tables on Brigham Young. And we are. We went to Rupert and now we went to Tooele. So watch out Salt Lake City. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.